Hey, sports fans. Welcome to the Greg Medford Show. I'm your host, Greg. We're here in Atlanta, Georgia. 2022 Blade Show. We've been going around inviting uh, some of our favorite knife makers and notable knife makers and bringing them over for a quick chat. Uh, it's nice to get a little behind the scenes thoughts and uh, some of the creati- creative madness that goes into knife making and uh, also some of the stories that go behind the knife makers and it's been fun to talk to folks. Uh, our next guest is Murray Carter. Uh, Murray, tell us a little bit about, uh, I, you've got a really interesting background as a both Japanese master bladesmith and American master bladesmith. So you've been swinging hammers, so to speak, on steel for a long time, more than most people in the room. Give, give us a little perspective on that. Would you have maybe uh, some of the differences? What made you go to Japan and become a bladesmith in Japan? Was that your primary reason for going or did, was it fluke? Yeah, so I first went to Japan, Greg, when I was 18 to study karate and had a chance encounter with a 16th generation Japanese bladesmith. What style of karate were you studying? Uh, Chitoryu. Okay. Yeah. Is that Ken Wamabuni's style? Uh, Who's Chitoryu? Chitoryu is an offshoot of Shotokan. Yeah. And uh, the stances are a little higher and it's uh, it's a little bit... Uh, Emphasizes mobility a little bit more than some who, of the Who is the founder stances. of the uh, Shito? Uh, his name was uh, Chitose Sensei. Okay. All and right, cool. uh, it, it started in Kumamoto, Japan. Okay. And I don't know. I'm a little out of touch with the, the history. That okay. was 33 years ago. Yeah, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Chitoryu, the Hombu Dojo is in uh, Tsuboi, uh, Kumamoto, Japan. And that's where I went to uh, further my study of karate when I was 18. I had started when I was 15. Uh, but I don't know a whole lot about the karate world anymore. I'm a little out of touch. Yeah, I'm out of date with it too. But <laughs> curious. So uh, you're over there on this uh, martial arts journey and you run into a blade master, blade That's, smith, that's yep. right, yeah. Right. I mean, I had no idea who I was running into at the time. <laughs> I had no idea of the significance of 450 years of uh, continuous uh, uh, line of uninterrupted bladesmiths dating back to the 1600s but uh, there I was 18 year old real interested in knives my whole life no experience making them real no experience sharpening them and uh, at the doorstep of the 16th generation Yoshimoto bladesmith kind of uh, knocking on the door and asking what was going on got a warm invite inside and the rest is history as they say to, to date, uh, I've forged over 30,000 knives in 33 years, and I'm the 17th generation Yoshimoto bladesmith with the uh, fortunate slash unfortunate <laughs> ominous responsibility of identifying and finding the 18th generation Yoshimoto bladesmith. You got anybody on the horizon yet? Yeah, uh, my apprentice Taylor over in uh, Council, Idaho. Should I uh, meet an untimely demise or become unable to continue forging knives it, it would be him and uh, you know that's not to say 10 or 20 or 30 years from now something might change one either one of us might not be here sure if I'm not here then he's 18th generation uh, hey what happened to the 16th is he has he passed uh, no uh, 16th generation sensei Sakemoto is uh, hopefully coming to our grand opening to our shop this July 2nd in council idaho i talked to him last saturday and he said uh, if he can make it he's going to so he's 16th and you're the anointed 17th i'm 17th and uh was he uh he's got obviously uh domestic students in japan right uh no you know once he passed the torch to me about with bladesmithing well first of all for your listeners uh enjoyment if they're interested on youtube there's a 17 minute video called history of the yoshimoto bladesmiths it's on the Carter Cutlery channel. But it's an interview with Sensei Sakimoto. It's all in subtitles. It's in Japanese, but you can follow along nicely. And he gives that 450-year history. And, uh, I mean, straight from the horse's mouth. And uh, he explains that he was never really interested in bladesmithing. <laughs> but when he saw that the lineage was going to phase, you know, peter out, he jumped on board as a stopgap measure hoping that someone else who was really interested in bladesmithing would come along and he would keep the tradition and the history and the lineage alive long enough to pass it on to somebody who really wanted to do it 
So it was kind of an altruistic move that he made, mm. simply, simply yeah. for the honor, uh, you know, of that family lineage. And then I came along, and he was like, "Wow, I'm so lucky! Here comes a guy who really wants to be a bladesmith. <laughs> he's, he's not a Japanese guy, but he has the enthusiasm, so I'll pass it along." So his story, and you can hear that from him <laughs> in the video. So, so he's all just all too relieved that he doesn't have to do bladesmithing anymore because his he was never. It wasn't his heart. It wasn't in his heart, right? But, but it was in his heart to preserve the tradition. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah, I came along. He passed it on to me, and and I think if he asked him today, he'd be very happy as to what happened to that. 17 generations of Yoshimoto bladesmithing. Do you uh, make any swords currently or just knives? Yeah, I've made a couple of swords. It's not my area of expertise. I know enough about them to get myself in trouble, but it's not it's not a service I offer to the cutlery industry, you know, for money. And was that the specialty of the lineage? Was it uh, knives uh, or was it uh, were swords mixed in there or was it just knives? You yeah, know, historically, uh, it's sword smithing was the lineage. Uh, with the defeat of Japan after World War II, mm -hmm. the swordsmiths were forbidden to continue to make swords, and that didn't change, I think, until 1964. Uh, but by that time, our family of bladesmiths had been uh, become deeply entrenched in agricultural tools, and uh, the main focus of which was kitchen cutlery. Okay. And so, yeah, they, many, many Japanese blades, you know, swordsmiths pivoted quite quickly in 1945 at their unconditional surrender and if they wanted to continue hammering steel you know they yeah. had to find a marketable yeah the same as the wagon wheelers uh, about 1910 right you, could, you gotta figure something else out that's once right. a car came along that's right yeah okay all right fascinating um how long did you train with him for it's for six years okay now, it was a very atypical informal apprenticeship i used their forge as my home base but he sent me all over the country to study with different bladesmiths. For example, he'd say, look, if you, if you want to get into forge welding, you need to go to Kawashiri because that's what they're well known for. And so I would go there and spend time there, learn forge welding, come back to, to his shop, forge weld a few blades, show him, and then he'd say, okay, now you got forge welding down pat. Now, now you got to learn about polishing. You need to go to Sakai in uh, Osaka because they're famous for polishing their blades. It's like blades. a talent broker. Yeah. He, kind of, he was yeah. brokering you out for the best talent in yeah, the country. Yeah, and then I got to go to Seki and Echizen and all, over, you know, basically by the time 18 years were up, I had spent a considerable amount of time in every major cutlery manufacturing city in Japan with the contacts and mentors and tutors and uh, they just all for the most part, very graciously took me under their wing and, and taught me what they knew. Oh, that's a pretty amazing story. So uh, you're now 36. How, wh how long did it take you to get fluent in Japanese? Did you say I'm 36? Uh, when you, after, after 18 years in Japan. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. 35, 35, that's right. Okay. I thought you were saying, I look no, 36 not this now. Yeah, that's, that's great, Greg. That's, <laughs> and you, you look to be about 41. And, yeah. and, I, and I need glasses, too. <laughs> So uh, you, uh, you, you're, you're now 35 years old at the time. Yes. Uh, as you kind of wrap up about 18 years of training, you got over there at 18. How long did it take you to get fluent in Japanese? That's a great question. So I was in Japan for nine months. Didn't speak a word of Japanese before I went outside of the vocabulary that every karateka learns. Like, yep. each knee on she, yeah. migi, hidari, migi, hidari. And uh, I went over very intimidated by the language. But in nine months... I picked up enough conversational Japanese that when I came back to North America, I enrolled immediately at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, because they had a really, I had heard they had a really strong Japanese program there. And I convinced the dean of the uh, Japanese program to let me into second year Japanese conversational and reading and writing classes. And the only reason he did that is is because I proved to him that I would work through in those first two months all of the textbooks from the first year program. So in one academic year from September to April, I did the 100 level and 200 level classes. And then I signed up for the six week intensive spring 300 level classes, reading and writing and conversation. 
And then I signed up for the six week summer intensive 400 level like honorifics and reading the newspaper and then the conversation classes. So in one calendar year, I worked through the whole four year Japanese program. And that was after you'd had nine months in, conversational in immersion over there. That's right. And then I went immediately back, back to, to Japan. Japan. Okay. You're like, okay, I'm getting my teeth kicked in. I got to go back and sharpen my chops. That's right. All right, cool. And then how comfortable did you feel linguistically at that point? Probably overconfident. Yeah. Because it's a language of subtlety and inference, right? Oh, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at that time. Right. I just, you know, this bull in a china shop, come, you yeah, know, yeah. ring a bell. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just, it's its really a miracle of God when I was just telling some other young person. I mean, I was young, I was drinking heavily, I was obstinate, I was self-centered. And the fact that anything went well for me in Japan is just a miracle of God because by all stretch of the imagination, I was just burning bridges everywhere I went. I mean, because I was just a young, dumb North American. Buck. Yeah, young buck. Yeah, and, and I didn't understand subtleties. I didn't understand omoyari, which means consideration for others. I, mean, I was just a self-centered drunk, basically. But I had a passion for knives, and something must have clicked somewhere, whether it was with the language and, 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 and my, my unique expression of the language as a foreigner. I don't know think I could piece it together but maybe I can't I think there's a supernatural component of just being blessed and having a path that was forged before me before I got there but anyway it went real well and I still have great friends I have many many contacts from 33 years ago now and uh, now as a mature 53 year old I can go and I can over a meal say I was I was such a jerk Will you forgive me? And they go, oh, yeah, we, we knew that, but we still put up with you. <laughs> and I can make amends yeah. and, and then have a real genuine relationship because we have a past and we've all matured now. And I can show gratitude for what I learned over there and what they, you know, their kindness is in their long suffering towards me. I can express <laughs> gratitude for that. You know, I've had young bucks around me, too, who are still pawing and scratching at themselves trying to figure out who they are. And uh, as a guy who did a bunch of that self-damage, figuring out who I was, I see it and I kind of, I got a lot of grace about it because you go, well, I know, where he, I know where he's coming from, but he really likes knives, so I'm going to show him. <laughs> <laughs> or they really like Kempo Karate, so I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i teach him what the hell. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get it. I get it. And, you know, there's, I think our passions bind us more than our flaws separate us. Because we can find kindred moments with other human beings. Like, oh, he, he's a drunk and he smells, but he really loves throwing clay pottery. And I do too, so I, I put up with him. You know, I think our passions kind of overrule our shortcomings sometimes. Well, that's a great perspective. I appreciate that. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> well, it's not a rule. It's just a Gregism. So uh, you get back, you uh, punch out of Japan, come back to the United States, and uh, uh, dive into smithing here. That's right. Well, as a native-born Canadian, I had to go through a very arduous and lengthy process to immigrate to the United States, yeah. which, which in many ways gave my experience over in Japan great value because it was based on what I had accomplished over there in my bladesmithing study that allowed me to immigrate to the United States as an alien of extraordinary ability. So that, that put all of my experiences in Japan in a beautiful little package with like a ribbon on it and oh, made, that, that was it. the column that gave you uh, footing to immigrate exactly oh because you had the foreign training that's right oh that's bizarre yeah that was a that was a, a real miracle in itself <laughs> and then uh, yeah in 2005 I immigrated here to the United States with my family and set up a small bladesmithing shop in the traditional Japanese format with all of the equipment I had brought over from Japan in Vernonia Oregon which is a little tiny logging town northwest of Portland Okay. And are you still functioning there? I was there until 2011, moved closer to the city of Portland to a town called Hillsboro, where for 10 years I uh, had industrial space and expanded this, the, the scope of my shop, trained a lot of apprentices, took on employees. And at one time there was, uh, I think, 11 or 12 of us all involved in the manufacture and selling of tr traditional Japanese-style cutlery all hand forged 
And uh, recently, in May of this year, I moved full time to Council, Idaho, where I now I have another small Japanese you know, a shop that is dedicated to the traditional manufacturer of Japanese hand forged blades. Oh, very cool. Do you work there solo or do you have any apprentices there? Uh, there's five of us working there at the time, three involved, myself included, in forging blades, one full time handle maker, and my son who runs all of the uh, administrative side, you know, payroll, taxes, website maintenance, uh, you name it. If it involves pen and paper and a computer, that's his job. Tell me a little bit about uh, the process. Uh, so are you guys using automatic hammers uh, for your forging, or is it? can you give me a little lay of the land? Because uh, the American public is probably terribly ill-informed, but more informed than the last 75 years because of shows like Force and Fire. They've been watching forging and hammering and making going on more than ever. Sure. I'll try to spill it out quickly. So we use traditional steel from Japan. Uh, the core steel for the cutting is Hitachi white steel number one. Really clean steel in terms of phosphorus and sulfur. And it's just, the balance is just iron and 1.4% carbon. So really high carbon. And we heat that steel, uh, which is usually laminated, laminated to something softer on the outside. So we're talking about a three layer laminate, like an Oreo cookie with the steel on the inside and the softer steel on the outside. We heat that up in a solid fuel forge. So we heat it up in either a coke, which is refined coal, or we use charcoal, wood charcoal, pine wood charcoal to heat the steel. And yeah, probably 99% of the 1,000 individual hammer blows that fall on that blade until it's finished are done under a Japanese spring hammer. So it's not automatic from the point of like a CNC machine, but we hold the steel by hand with tongs under the power hammer. We press a pedal with our foot to varying degrees to uh, to control the speed and the strength of the hammer blow. And we move the workpiece underneath that dun, 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 the power yep. hammer as, yep. it's, as it's hammering and uh, reheating it as necessary in the solid fuel forge. Then when the blade is forged to shape, we anneal the blade in rice straw ashes, the same bucket of rice straw ashes that I brought over with me in 2005. If I lose my rice straw ashes, I guess I gotta go back to Japan and go buy some more rice straw. And then, uh, and then the blade is coated in clay that also came from Japan. It's Akatsuchi, which is used in the roofing industry. Can you reuse it over and over? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then he heated again in the charcoal fire, quenched in water. And then we grind the blades on huge rotating water stones, which for years we were uh, sourcing from Japan, as, just as we had used over there. Uh, but then we, then we had a manufacturer over here work with us, and we actually created a, a, our own rotating water stone here in North America. What kind of stone is it? You know, I don't even know what the abrasive is, and I don't know what the bonding agent is. But uh, oh, but they're 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 re they're. It uh, looks like a giant donut. It's a yard. It's not actually stone, then. It's a uh, it's a fe it's made. I think it's a cement okay. product. Yeah, okay. Basically, okay. with probably like aluminum oxide or something, okay. garnet or something as an abrasive. And uh, so we developed those over here. I kind of told them what I want. They said, how's this? I said, it's too soft. They said, how's this? I said, not abrasive enough. And they said, how's this? I said, abrasive is perfect. Hardness is perfect. We got it. So that's, that was the process. Yeah. And uh, so we grind all the blades after they're hardened, after they're quenched in water. And uh, to do all the handle work. You know, that, that, then from there, it's pretty much a standard process as any yeah. Western bladesmith would be familiar with the handle work. Do, the, do your blades go down to a, a zero, or do they go down and get a micro bevel on them, like a, a, a Western knife? Yeah, they, they're more like a Western knife in that they've got a secondary edge, and then they've got a micro bevel, which I call a primary edge. Yep. The, the stark difference would be they're just considerably thinner in both of those dimensions than what you'd normally encounter. What, what's the thickness on the back of a typical kitchen knife? Uh, so we measure the thickness right where the Carter stamp is, and since it's kind of a continual distal taper, it's a subjective measurement. But a typical kitchen knife uh, is going to be like around 1.6 millimeters thick at, at the spine. Uh, 3.1, 3 3 which would be about half, 
is like an eighth, so it'd be two thirty seconds. Okay. No, All right. So right? a sixteenth. Yeah. Yeah, about a sixteenth. Something like a sixteenth. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fascinating. Pretty thin. And so the five of you are cranking away, or three of you cranking away, forging blades, one handle finisher specialist. Yeah, and he only finishes my handles on my outdoor knives. So the other two guys who, who make knives under their own brand, the Muteki brand, they do the work from start to finish. It's, yeah. They do their own handles also. They do their own handles they also. Do their own, they do, what do their you guys use all different kinds of woods for handles? Or do you do plain to exotic? Or do you have like kind of a standard you yeah, really no, prefer? Yeah, plain to exotic. My, the, my pet peeve is uh, handles that three years later come back because they've uh, s- swollen or shrunk because of the change of the climate. So I'm, I'm really a stickler for stable handle materials. I don't want to put anything on there that three years from now is going to bite us. So what do you use? Well, we use a lot of ironwood for starters. We almost always laminate it to something like a G10 uh, liner material or a micarta liner material. So you've got the natural with the man-made glued together before you know, they become okay. one unit yeah. before we machine them to be a handle. It's all, all ground by hand. We don't have any CNC machines or anything. Everything's just done on two by 72 inch belt grinders if it's not done on the giant rotating water stone. Uh, do you guys have dust collection system for all that uh, wood dust flying around? We do, we do, and we've got uh, some pretty capable air scrubbers hanging from the walls. We cool. cha- change those filters as often as we can. Cool. That's been one of the maddening challenges in my grind area with eight guys grinding full time. I put these, I put two big external water sucking units because we grind a lot of titanium and fire is an issue Mm -hmm. so smooth first it was rough pipes then it was smooth pipes and then it was big gentle turn pipes and uh and then it was too much water not enough water we finally got it to where we don't have a fire every other day but uh getting rid of the dust is a big deal um how uh how how much longer do you think you're going to keep making knives well at, at 30,000 knives in 33 years, at 53 years old, I guess I probably got another 30,000 knives left in me. Only only because I can work faster now. I can okay. get this next 30 done in 20 years. I'll be <laughs> 73. Okay. But you know knife makers never retire as long as they're physically able to keep making knives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go until they start wearing out. <laughs> Oh, so what's your Scottsdale connection? Have you been down? To, you've been down in Arizona, I take it. Yes. What? Uh, so Bobby's my, my my producer's hollering from the side about a Scottsdale connection. Tell me. Well, Bobby is my Scottsdale connection. <laughs> Tim. Tim Hancock. Oh yeah 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 yeah. How could I omit that? So when I was still living in Japan and I became a member of the American Blazeman Society, and I was preparing to take my first performance test. I flew over from Japan with blades I had made over there out of straight, simple carbon steel. And I tested with Tim Hancock, Master Smith Tim Hancock. And so he uh, supervised my first ever performance test and I passed it there. And then, you know, the following June, I submitted knives at the blade show here for journeyman status consideration. And then a few years later, 2001, I became a master bladesmith. Nice. Well, it's an auspicious uh, it's an auspicious title with uh, from both countries. You know, it's funny. I grew up. We're we're the same age, so I grew up enamored with martial arts. Started training in the early 70s and kind of kept going all the way until my my right knee kind of said, "Hey, hey, boss, that's about enough." And I was an air show pilot, and then I got into I got into making knives on a lark in 2010. Oh, did you say an air show pilot? Yeah. Yeah, I flew warbirds and stuff. Oh, wow. Built airplanes and kind of flown just about every damn thing there is. Now we have a lot in common. (laughs) Um, It's amazing how these connections, uh, you know, it's weird to say, but Enter the Dragon and martial arts films. When I was a kid, they were formative sure. because there wasn't a million channels of everything on. Sure. Saturday morning, there was, you know, Sunday morning, there was Kung Fu Theater on. You mm-hmm. know, you got to watch martial arts stuff. My dad was into Yaido, Yaido and uh, had done Japanese, uh, you know, quick draw sword stuff for years. 
so I was uh, in I was a total Nipponophile and enamored with all edged things you know so I got into doing martial arts the Japanese martial arts and then ended up getting into Kempo later in life and got into airplanes and knives and it all a lot of it you know it's funny to watch the rambling of our lives as we look back like a little river coming down the mountain you know the strange turns it takes and you see how they're totally connected but you'd never make the call like I would have never in advance said oh yeah he's gonna be a knife maker but if I look back on it and deconstruct it, I go, oh, all makes sense. Make, makes sense. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, you're, um, what, what got you out of Oregon and into uh, Idaho? Is it uh, is the politics of the region? Uh, is it the uh, weather and the climate? Uh, what was it? Well, I had the opportunity to buy some land out there, a little ranch. And then I met some people and started to attend church with them and really enjoyed their fellowship in that community and felt uh, felt like I really wanted to be plugged into that community. So that, more than anything else, was the impetus behind moving full-time to Idaho. I've been there for a month now, full-time, and uh, it's been the best month of my life. Very cool. Th- th- there's no question that Idaho is more conservative and more freedom-loving, but... Uh, for me, I would have followed this group of people to any corner of the world. It's a Mennonite community, and I, I really mm. enjoy their sincerity of faith and uh, their sincerity of uh, dedication towards community and uh, service to society and service to the world. And I feel uh, greatly honored to be part of their community. And that's that, for me, was the main motivation. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh Fantastic having you here. I appreciate you taking a few moments out of your day to come sit with us. Um, I love getting a chance to sit down and a uh, little bit longer format, get more than a 30-second sound bite out of folks, find out kind of what makes them tick. And uh, You know, we've got an audience, and uh, it's a lot of tactical and military and law enforcement crowd. Um, I was saying as you walked up today, I had seen a much younger video of you from years ago sharpening. I'm, I thought it was a butter knife, but it must have been a, maybe it was a spoon where you sharpened it up and shaved your face. And I think you had like a beard and you shaved it off. And I, I was like, <laughs> I was like, all right, I like this guy. It's kind of funny. And then and then uh, and then Bobby here says, oh, I'm friends with this guy. And I said, man, I think I know. I think I watched that guy in a video. So uh, it's nice how everything comes full circle. Pleasure having you here. Thank you, Greg, for the interview. It was an honor. Ah, well, awesome. Thank you. All right, sports fans, listen, that's the Greg Medford Show, Blade Show, 2022, Murray Carter. Um, hey, um, Murray, real, real quick, if folks want to buy a knife from you, how, where do they go? What, what's your website? Yeah, our website is cartercutlery.com. Cartercutlery.com. Step up, folks, and get some cool American-made Japanese cutlery.